Looks like it's still just you and me here. There we go. Oh, yeah. Something better trickling then. We'll let people trickle in for a bit before getting started, everyone. Thank you for joining. Hopefully everyone's had a great week. Excited for the weekend. Uh, hello, Arup. Feel free to uh, familiarize yourselves. We have a chat here uh, for some interaction as well. Um, for any first time users. <clears throat> we need like some elevator music or something while, we <laughs> while we're waiting here. So when people have got questions, they put them in the chat. How does it work? Yes, exactly. So there's a chat. We got Jay, Marcus Jones. Everyone's kind of trickling oh, yeah. in now. Thanks, everyone. Excited to have you all here. <laughs> Weekend mode. Hello, Silas. Got 20 so far. Got to get up to 30 or so and then can start kicking off. Thank you everyone for joining as well. Maybe on your lunch breaks. Where's everyone joining from? Text into the, the chat. Maybe we can make it interactive here. I saw someone tweeted saying they really dislike it at the beginning of calls where people go, where are you from? And oh, I really? Thinking, and I was thinking the reason is once upon a time you used to say, hey, how are you doing? And then COVID hit and everyone went, well, not feeling really yeah. well, depressed, got COVID. So people went, never ask how people are doing. But you have uh, to have an icebreaker. So you go, where are you yeah. from? Okay, so you, it's, it's, it's you, now hard to, uh, yeah. Yeah, in the UK, it's always, uh, how's the weather where you are, I feel like. <laughs> I did a webinar yesterday with uh, Ukrainian startups, uh, mostly based in Kiev, which is obviously going to be a bit uh, difficult. And I, you know, as always went, and how are we doing? And somebody <laughs> went, well, as well as under the circumstances, it was generally yeah. quite down. It was quite sad, actually. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have a few members of our team based in, in Ukraine. And I've had, to, had the, that experience as well. <laughs> um, okay, I think we're at 43 now, so we can go ahead and get going. I uh, just want to say welcome to everyone. Looks like we're calling in lots of people from London. Uh, we've got a Leeds person here. Let's go Leeds United tonight. Big game. Uh, we'll be watching that. We have a few founders as well from Leeds. Um, Bon Appetit, if you're watching while on your lunch break, uh, we are super excited to be joined by Anthony Rose today. Uh, he is serial entrepreneur. He's now co-founder and CEO of Seed Legals. Uh, Seed Legals is a resource that I use personally uh, as a founder whenever I was founding. Um, it is a great resource for your early uh, cor corporate legal work. Uh, they assist with all of that, data rooms, um, SEIS advanced assurance, uh, SEIS compliance. Uh, not only did I use them, we also pretty much uh, direct all of our founders at Hyper to seed legals at a certain point, whether it be um, you know for the advanced assurance or for the compliance. Uh, Anthony, thank you for joining. Um, we're uh, joined by uh, many aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, most of them very early stages in their journey. So it'd be great to get a little bit of a background into you uh, and how you, you know, came up with Seed Legals. All right, thank you, and hello, everyone. So I'm Anthony. I uh, once, I years ago, I used to be in three in hardware, then 3D graphics, and I was living in Australia. Then I moved to the UK and joined the BBC. I headed up BBC iPlayer. Uh, you know, learned how to run a large team and create uh, products that your users love. Uh, but then it was time to get back to startup roots. I left, built a startup, sold it, built another startup, sold it, invested in a few, and got tired of paying lawyers. And then I met my business partner, Laura. 
genius XBC serial angel investor, and we got together to create C Legal so that no one else needs to go to a lawyer, at least for you know corporate uh, fundraising and other things. Divorces are a separate one. So, uh, so we're now 160 people at C Legals. Uh, we're mostly based in London. We have an office in France and in Ireland as well. Um, and our goal is that for everything as an entrepreneur, there's now a platform for that. And it's not just about the legals, but it's about the uh, information, data, videos, knowledge on how to do everything. So anything you need as part of your startup journey, my goal is between the platform and our team to be there to help. And of course, having been a serial founder myself, and I know that one of the things we're going to talk about is being your own audience. If you can build a product that you use and it works for you, and you're representative of the audience, that's a great start. So I can't imagine running a business not on seed legals. Awesome. Yeah, you have quite uh, quite the experience. I think you know having that initial experience as a founder, you kind of just alluded to it. Uh, a lot of people call it founder market fit, which is where you as a founder uh, lived and experienced the problems that you're now seeing. Um, you know, like how much weight do you put on the importance of a founder having that? Is it possible to go out there? And what kind of strategies would you use if you didn't have that lived experience? That's a really great point. So I learned this first at the BBC, where in the initial days of BBC iPlayer, the problems were all technical, how to have the internet not fall over and the video not buffer and compress it in somewhat real time. And they're all really geeky technical problems. And uh, the users initially were largely geeky, technical, often men, uh, middle age, watching Top Gear. And uh, there was perfect sort of product market fit. I just need to make a product that I would use myself for watching Top Gear. But then as the audience widened, it turned out people were watching EastEnders at lunch and the requirements became things that I would never have guessed. Like when we did user surveys, I want to be able to uh, operate with one hand because I'm eating a sandwich with another while watching EastEnders and it needs to remember like the 10 minutes that I've watched so that I can have lunch and, and, and resume later and so on. So if you are the audience yourself, you build it for what you want. And if you represent other people, you just keep going until it works for you. So at Seed Legals, every time, you know, obviously all the people we hire, we use our own employment agreements. So every time somebody, you know, is in a different country and needs extra wording, we just sort it and then you get to product market fit quickly. However, you know, in, in many cases as a founder, you can be your own audience and that's that's why you created the product. But often it's the case that either you or your team are not. So a typical use case is you're making a product for, you know, wills or funerals or insurance for elderly people. And all your developers are in their 20s or something, and you're in your 20s or 30s, um, but your audience is in their 80s. And that becomes difficult because you have no idea if they're using an iPhone, what font size do they use? Your dark mode pattern is probably going to be a disaster. So, uh Anytime you are not the audience yourself as a founder, I think things are substantially harder. And it means either you have to really learn to be your audience, which is a bit fake sometimes, or you need to employ people who will represent your audience, or you need to do a lot more research. So it's not always possible, but life is much easier if you're your own audience. Amazing. And I guess... I think one of the ways that you kind of get around that is really ideating early on with uh, some user and customer feedback. Um, how do you incorporate user and customer feedback at Seed Legals? Well, it's a good point because I'm quite fixated, as my colleagues know, on uh, what I call uh, you know customer-driven development. So I talk personally to customers many every day, and of course I'm on events and meeting people. And by doing that, the founder slash CEO is sees exactly what customers want because all too often what happens is you sit huddled in your office, you build stuff, you put it on your website, and there's there's no real connection between people looking at your website and, and what you're building. And you have to break that wall. And the first way to break the wall is to use a chatbot on your, I mean, not, not an AI chatbot, but a chat bubble uh, on your website like Intercom or HubSpot or others. 
so that all the drive-bys on your website become interactive experiences. Because when people go to your website and they just leave, you have no idea why. But imagine that, you know, the chat bot pops up and goes, can I help you with X? So come up with a question that's going to elicit a response. Hey, are you looking to do X or Y? Don't just go, can I help you today? And then when people begin interacting, then you can turn those drive-bys into conversations. And then you want to involve as many people in your team as possible in those customer interactions. So at Seed Legals, the way it works is that as you know, the chat bubble becomes an important part of the way our customers interact with us. It's not just a platform, but our support team will try to answer all questions, but when they can't, they'll pop it in a Slack channel and the developers look in the Slack channel and I look in the Slack channel. So the entire company is fixated on seeing what uh, questions customers are asking. And then my mantra is the third time somebody asks us something, let's put use technology to put ourselves out of business. So can we write an article? Can we do a video? Can we improve the platform or the hint text? So you do everything manually until you are able to understand the problem space and then automate it, which, are, which I call, you know, fake it till you make it. <laughs> Not Terranos style, but it's about being awesome doing things manually, but that's not a scalable business, but it helps you learn what customers want and gives customers the answer. And then if you keep getting repeat questions of the same thing, now improve your product to do that. That is amazing, super valuable insights. Uh, I do just want to say one thing to the uh, all the listeners here or viewers here. Um, if you guys do have any questions, uh, feel free to put them into the chat uh, and I or Anthony will field them um, either ad, ad hoc or at the end. Um, we will try and save about 10 minutes at the end for specifically for Q&A as well. So if you want to save something, uh, please do that. Um, I'm going to try and like kind of pivot the uh, conversation a bit more towards what I think a lot of you are probably really interested in, and that is fundraising. Um, so I think, you know, let's chat a little bit about SEIS and EIS. Um, they are uh, investment schemes here in the UK, but let's let the expert here, Anthony, discuss that. Can you explain what it is and uh, what is the value for early founders? Okay, so there's a fantastic government uh, HMRC initiative in the UK, which give investors a tax break. So there are two versions of it, SEIS, Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, and its bigger brother, EIS, Enterprise Investment Scheme. What it means, and I'll focus on the SEIS piece, is that if an investor invests in your company and you can offer them these SEIS tax breaks, they can deduct 50% of their investment in your company from their income tax payable this year, or they can backdate it to the last tax year. So if they're investing £50,000 in your company, they can deduct £25,000 from their taxable income. And if they keep the shares in your company for three years and sell them after that, they pay no capital gains tax. And if your company goes out of business later, then they can use loss relief to write off the rest of the loss against their tax. So it massively de-risks uh, investment for investors. Now, to be an, a qualifying investor, you have to be a UK taxpayer because it's against your UK tax investing individually. So basically, it's about you going out to angel investors. Now, the thing to know is that most companies promise SEIS tax relief to their investors. So if your company is not, you are relatively a lot less investable. So the magic formula is that you're on your pitch deck or on your pitch or your LinkedIn posts where you're telling people, hey, I'm raising magic words, you know, offering SEIS. And then on your pitch deck, you would say, you know, have advance assurance. So what is advance assurance? Well, actually, these SEIS tax benefits, once you've raised investment and issued shares in the company, then you do something called the SEIS compliance, which is you fill in some forms and then HMRC gives you back a magic number called the UIR. And that then gets uh, filled in and given to investors who can then claim their tax deductions. But the question from investors is going to be, that's awesome. How do I know that your company qualifies? Can you guarantee it? And for that, you can write to HMRC beforehand, and that's called getting advanced assurance, where you fill in some information, and uh, and then they write back with a 
uh, letter going, you qualify and you cannot tell your investors you've got advance assurance. So generally, although advance assurance isn't legally required, most investors will ask for it. So the formula is as soon as you begin talking to investors, it's worthwhile getting advance assurance. So when investors ask, you can go, yes, I've, get my, I've got my advance assurance, which is the difference between them saying, I'm in versus great, amazing, call me when you've got your advance assurance. And you can do the advance assurance application and the compliance in a nice automated way on seed legals. So you don't faff around and get rejected. And the numbers are about 51% of all advance assurance applications are done through seed legals and the the success rate is like 98 percent as opposed to like 67 percent on hmrc because we find the problems before hmrc finds the problem so they correct it before you send it to hmrc amazing i'm just replying to tommy's question does this content only apply to people in the uk the scis and eis portion uh does um but we will be discussing some other uh, ah. you know, early, early corporate legal work that might apply to you in, have you written in maybe Australia? Yeah. I'm not sure where you're at, but uh, other places. As well. uh, but, but by the way, it's the, there are a few tricks that people don't know with SEI. So because it's a deduction on your UK income tax, obviously the investor has to be the UK taxpayer because that's their deduction. But the company doesn't actually need to be a UK company. So if you have a company in Australia, for example, you can still offer, amazingly, these tax breaks to UK investors. And uh, to do that, it's a bit more work. You have to register as a foreign entity in the UK. You've still got your Australian, for example, top company. You're raising investment in that. And we can help you sort that out on Seed Legals as well. So the interesting thing is you don't have to have a UK company. Amazing. Um, OK, I'm, I'm actually realizing maybe we should. I'll, I'll try and field some of them. Uh, as we go, but uh, we'll let's save the majority of the questions here for the end, especially like the more specific ones, uh, just so we don't get too, too much derailed. Um, going into uh, like super valuable insights on SEIS for sure. Um, I think let's kind of go into a little bit of the current state of fundraising in the UK. I think you've you've helped and now you're helping one third of all uh, founders raise their initial rounds. Um, so probably no one else has more insights into the current state of fundraising here in the UK. So if you could please, you know, tell us about that a bit. Okay. So, I mean, we've all seen that in 2021, 20, 22 fundraising valuations were enormous, mostly in the U S and then they've come way down, um, you know, fundraising or investors wanting to invest, I think is very much driven by the cost of capital for investors. So when they earn 0% interest in the bank, any speculation in a startup was better than getting 0%, assuming they weren't going to lose their money. But if they're getting 8% in the bank or 5% and they've got mortgages that are up, then uh, they it only makes sense for an investor if they've got a much higher chance of a return on investment in a startup. Plus, they need to have the money not putting into their mortgage and so on. So there's been less capital available. That doesn't mean there's no investment happening on seed legals. Actually, there was more investment raised in 2023 than in 2022. Um, even though overall the numbers were down, that probably meant we ate someone else's market share. But there are a few things to know that are important. The first thing is you might be thinking, should I wait and fundraise later? Well, I would say no, because firstly, you've got your passion project that you want to do, if life is continuously on hold for something better in the future, there's no guarantee things will be better in the future. You never know what problems in the world will come out next. You might be waiting forever. And the first attribute of, of an entrepreneur is if you procrastinate, you're dead. So you want to get on. I mean, if, if, if this is the thing you want to do, then you want to get on with it and waiting is less good. But how do you make yourself more investable and how do you attract investors? So the first thing is, I think there's a movement from uh, uh, capital from more flighty things to safer things. So if you're a B2B SaaS company, those are always the most investable companies because your cost of building it is more modest. You can get customers quickly. They're paying customers. If you're building a social app, that's always hard because you have to get zillions 
thousands of users in a fickle market and investors don't understand it and investors are in their 40s or 50s and your app is designed for millennials. So some segments are harder than others. But of course, that doesn't help you because you want to build a social app and 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 that's it. But be prepared for things that are not B2B SaaS and these days maybe AI to be a little harder. The next thing is valuations. So, you know, this mostly applies to later stage rounds. Once you've got revenue, the, the investors would often value your company at a multiple of your annual recurring or annual revenue. And it used to be like 10 to 15 times annual revenue was the valuation multiple. Now it's more like six to eight times potentially. So if you're doing, you know, a million pounds a year in revenue, that might now be a 6 million as opposed to a 10 million valuation. But of course, if you're on this call, you're going, that's great. I'll wait till I get there. I don't have a product yet. So in your early days, of course, there's no revenue. There are no users. So, you know, the valuations are usually in the sort of one to two million pounds. And you're usually raising 100 to 200,000 pounds at the beginning would be the usual formula. So what you want to do is... If there's less money available, you want to cut through the noise and be more attractive to investors than anyone else. And we're going to talk about the art of the pitch in a moment. But the other thing is what there's the rise. And I think Seed Legals has somewhat created that in the UK of what I call agile fundraising. So once upon a time, it, the formula was like this. You're sitting there going, I need to raise investment. How much do I need? Well, I need to take out a spreadsheet and I need to, you know, investment is raising is hard. So I need to raise for like 12 to 18 months, maybe. So let's see how much I need to raise. Well, I need two developers. I need a data person, a marketing design, uh, sales, two founders. That's eight people. Let's say that's 50K a year each. So that's 400K a year. I need to raise for 18 months. I need to raise 600K. Great. And then the seed legals data shows that companies sell, uh, give away a median 15% equity in a funding round. So your investors will own 15%. In order, if you're selling 15% uh, equity in a funding round, it means your valuation is five times the amount you're raising. So the formula might be, okay, great, I'm raising 600K, 3 million pre-money valuation. That means the valuation before you've added the investment. So now you go, well, great. So now you're going to reach out to investors and you're raising at a 3 million valuation. And investors go, that's great. What's your revenue? And you go, I don't have any revenue. And they go, well, okay, how many users you've got? And you go, I don't have any users. Well, have you built it yet? No, they go, great, your valuation's too high, come back later. So come back later is the story of your life. The other thing is you didn't need £600,000 in the bank today. If you had £50,000, you could start paying yourself and start hiring developers or outsource, whatever it might be. So what you really want is a method where instead of waiting forever and kissing lots of frogs to raise a big round, what if you could raise smaller amounts first? And I call that agile fundraising. And 70% of fundraising on seed legals is not doing a funding round. It's raising before a round or topping up a round. And raising before a round is with a seed fast, which is our name for an advanced subscription agreement. That's the equivalent in the UK of a safe that's popular in the US. So a seed fast is instead of a funding round being like a bus trip where you have to get all the investors on the bus and the bus can only leave when the last one arrives and the bus has to be full, a seed fast is like taking an Uber. So you find an investor and then you uh, create a document that says the investor will give you money and you will give them shares when you do your funding round, add a valuation to be determined in the funding round. But because they're coming in early, you can give them a 10 or 20% discount. So you can, every time you meet someone at a party or you, know, you post on LinkedIn about the wonderful thing you're doing and you're raising, contact me and someone says, I'm interested in investing you know, 10K, instead of saying, 
great, call me in September, um, you can say, awesome, let me send you a seed fast to take your investment now, which will be really helpful to me so I can grow the business. And for you, I'll give you a 10 or 20% discount. And the combination of raising in this way before round and then topping up a round afterwards, instead of doing a new round or before doing a new round, like more than 70% of investment is now outside of a funding round. And when I explain that to people, they usually go, that's really useful. I still want to do a funding round. And then about three weeks later, call back and go, you know, it's awesome. I found an investor who wants to invest 10K. What do I do next? So it's just a natural new way of fundraising. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone, uh, you need to get used to hearing no a lot. I think even, you know, I have some anecdotes from even like Jeff Bezos, where he heard no, you know, hundreds of times before he, he finally got it funded. On that note, I will have to answer one question real quick. I see that Chloe asked for advice for raising seed outside of friends and family. I think this would be um, a great one for you to, to answer. Anthony, I have some ideas as well. Okay. So great question. So I think, you know, most founders uh, think that you're going to go to a VC for investment. You know, VCs have got websites, you read about them on TechCrunch. And so the first thing you do is you don't know any angel investors, of course. So you go off and uh, you find the investor lists, you'll find them on Seed Legals and elsewhere, the top UK funds, the most popular ones in Manchester, whatever it is, and you write to them. And if they respond, then you have a conversation which almost inevitably ends with love what you're doing, come back later. And the reality, unfortunately, is that funds will usually only invest once you've got revenue and products out there. It's just the way they work and their risk appetite and the size of the, the checks they can write is larger than you need and larger than the valuation you can sustain when you're pre product and pre-revenue. So your way to find investors initially is generally angel investors. But angel investors don't have websites saying I'm an angel investor. So where do you find angel investors? What's the formula? And I think the formula is that you be as shameless and noisy on social and everywhere as possible. So post on LinkedIn, make sure it doesn't look spammy and a financial promotion, but, you know, find a lifestyle picture of someone, you know, using your app, you know, Photoshop it, whatever it is, uh, whatever it might be, explain the passion and project you're working on in a few words, you know, raising investment, have SEIS and EIS, the magic words, contact me for more. And I think the more noise you make, the more interest you're going to get. And hopefully some people will contact you talking about wanting to invest or to learn more, but others will be talking about maybe as customers. Some people will tell you about competitors. People will write to you saying, dude, looks interesting, but I don't understand what it is. So you can use this as A-B testing for your message itself. Uh, if you have users, you can write to your users. And a perfect, a great example uh, of uh, this is uh, actually it, it, there's a company called Saudo Sofia, a bakery in Hackney run by Sophia. And, uh, you know, Sophia is a, a wonderful baker, but she's not a sort of fintech guru. And she has raised investment from like uh, over a hundred people using seed fasts. I'm convinced that everyone who comes into a bakery, she says, you know, would you like a sourdough baguette with bread? Would you like a baguette? And would you like to invest? So what you want to do is spread the message as widely as possible so that because pretty much everyone is potentially an angel uh, investor. There are also sites like scribelabs.ai where you can find uh, lists of investors who have invested in certain segments and then you can contact them. The other thing I think is what I call content marketing. So content marketing is writing blog posts, articles, and so on. And if you go to the resources section on Seed Legals, you'll find literally hundreds of articles, many of which I've written on you know, anything from SEIS to fundraising to finding investors to what if things don't work out. And the more content you create, you're making an SEO destination. You're creating longevity when people come to your website. You're establishing yourself as a thought leader. So, you know, if you're selling green tea, don't just 
have pictures of green tea, write articles about how they picked by people in midnight in Mount Fuji or something like that, or the ideal temperature of the water or the oxygen, whatever it might be. So a lot of content, and then that all becomes things you can spread on social and, and beyond. So I think in the early days, because angel investors don't have websites, you need to spread your message widely in a way that has people get back to you and then use sites like Scribe Labs to try and find lists of investors to write to. Nice. Thank you for that. Chloe, I'm going to come back and, to the second and, and, half and of I, your question later on. And I'm, and I'm sorry, yes, you also need to be used to, you know, people saying no. Uh, but saying no, one of the interesting things is investors tell you no for any number of reasons, most of which are, you know, essentially a bit of a fob off because they don't really know why they're saying no. They just didn't get to a yes. Um, some will give you random bits of information. And so in your mind, if you are pivoting your pitch deck based on every bit of feedback an investor gives you, you know, it will be a design by committee. It will be a disaster. But on the flip side, if you keep hearing the same thing again and again and you're ignoring it, that's a key signal you want to address it. It doesn't mean you have to change your product or your pitch, but you have to have a good answer for why it is what it is because you want to get to a yes um, and ultimately, if you keep hearing no, then you have to figure out, do you keep persevering or do you have to think of something else that gets you to a yes? That's one of the things I always uh, suggest to the founders is they're going to get feedback from investors. And then if you try and, you know, put that into to the you try and please everyone, you're going to end up pleasing no one. So, you know, stick to your guns. But there is some room to work with if you keep hearing the same feedback and make some adjustments. On the note of pitching, uh, that was a great segue for us. Um, what do you think are some of the most important elements to consider? Okay, so my take on pitching is, you know, I talk to lots of founders and when you're talking to somebody, you, you know, when, when your members are talking to each other, you, you talk to someone and you love what they're doing. They're telling you with such passion, a sparkle in their eyes, how they're solving this problem, doctor, dialysis machine, mother, something better you bought in. And then you see the pitch deck and you're completely lost in a mass of slides and MRR and business model and yeah, so on. So to me, a uh, pitch deck and a verbal pitch, it's all about the art of storytelling. And I'd like to think of it as like a Netflix series. The goal of the first episode is to get you to watch the second episode. And the th second one is to get you to watch the third. And of course, in this case, the last episode is writing a check. So you're going to start with somehow reaching out to people. LinkedIn outreach is a great way of doing it. Um, and your, your initial teaser is going to be a mini story in itself. But jumping back to the pitch deck, the pitch deck to me is the story arc and the story arc starts with what's the problem you're solving in the way that the reader sees themselves as the audience the customer how are you solving it so you have to show me what it is otherwise it's just vaporware maybe some nice screenshots lifestyle images then you're going to get to what's the size of the market who are your competitors What's your five-year business plan? So I'm going to see I'm going to make a return on investment. You're going to show me the team, the traction. And then at the end, don't forget to end with the ask slide. Now raising X amount, offering SEIs and EIS, contact so-and-so. And I'm surprised how many decks don't end with the ask. You go, thanks for showing me that. That was awesome. Dude, what do you want? But the most important slide on the deck is that very first one that establishes in one slide what you do, because realistically, nobody reads anything these days, you know. Um, so if the first slide isn't establishing what it is, and by the way, the best way to find this out is, you know, look at someone else's pitch deck. And if you get to the last page and somebody asks you, what do they do? And you go, mm -hmm. I don't really know, actually. And that's a giant fail. Whereas if your, if your first page is, you know, something is broken, the fastest way to do X or whatever it might be with the lifestyle image of a person sitting at a bus stop using your app, visible Photoshop, because you haven't built it, of course, that's just fine. And if the visuals on the slide can make clear what it is, you've actually solved a lot of the problem right there.
Yeah, I think I say this to a lot of founders as well is like they have this kind of subconscious bias that the reader would have a knowledge somewhat of what the business is. So you really have to just completely remove yourself from your business and just be like really crystal clear about what it is you do, how do you do it? And most importantly, why is this going to be a paradigm shift within the industry? Exactly. And I think also people write the deck as if the investor is not in any way a customer. But I think if I'm mm. investing in a company, I'm going to think, how are the founders going to be able to sell their product to actual customers? And if your slide deck for me is all about, we use distributed ledger technology to automate the thing, I know zero people in the world are going to want this because it's it's showing what you do rather than the problem you solve. And that, to me, is the key problem with slide decks that I see that describe how clever you are and what you do rather than why anyone wants it. So your your slide deck, to me, needs to, even though it's targeted an investor, if the investor can see it as a customer and it's solving a problem, even if they don't need that particular solution, if they see how people did want that solution, would want it, then mm -hmm. that's a great start. Yeah, it's like not only why people would want it, but also why people will buy it. That's really important. I think one of the other things I want to just touch on within, um, you know, as a founder, uh, you really have to just be getting comfortable with selling at all times. You know, you're selling your your business to uh, investors, uh, selling, let's say, the, the vision, the future to investors. Uh, you're selling your product to users. And then again, you're, you're also selling to initial early stage employees as well. So it's you know very important how you hire. Um, Anthony, kind of next question. Uh, what are, and then I think I want to touch on Chloe's question here. I, at least that's my answer to it. But what are some of the biggest mistakes you see founders making early in their uh, fundraising process? Okay, so uh, let's start with a couple of kind of like legal admin things. So just very occasionally we see companies incorporate on companies house with like super voting shares so you know you've all read sam altman fired by the board whatever it might be so you're worried and so you go great i'm going to incorporate with like special multiple share classes um literally 100 percent of the time i see companies founders do that it has to get undone later when you get to zuckerberg state you can have super voting shares until then if investors have more friction in your company uh, than others they're just going to invest in others so the formula is when you start your company it's basically a hundred ordinary shares split between the founders you'll do a share split later don't try and do fancy stuff with none voting, super voting, whatever shares, because it's going to get uh, rejected by investors and a huge amount of pain to try and undo that later. The second thing is that founders generally think that they're going to get fired by the investors and they have to protect themselves against the investors. And maybe much later stage that becomes a problem. But in the early stages, the biggest problem founders have are their co-founders. So... Founder fallouts are not uncommon. 10, 20% of the time, there's going to be a founder fallout. If there are more than three founders, that, that number is higher. So the very first thing you want to do after you've incorporated is all the founders should sign a founder agreement. So a founder agreement is one per founder between the founder and the company that says, if I leave within a certain period called the vesting period, I have to return some of my shares to the company. So typically the shares might vest over three years. And if the person leaves after six months because it didn't work out, they have to give back, you know, five, six of their shares, uh, or you can set it so they have to give back all of their shares if they don't stick around for the first year, for example. And if you don't have that, then the company becomes uninvestable because the departed founder now owns 50% or 30% of the shares. They claim the IP is theirs. Uh, they, they steal the, the team. They create a competing company. It's a giant mess. So a founder agreement, in addition to saying, if I leave in a certain period, I have to give some shares back, also has... IP assignments, so all the intellectual property belongs to the company. It's got none compete and none solicitation. 
So if things do go pear-shaped and a founder exits, you open the playbook, the legal agreement, you go, oh, you've been here for this number of months, you keep this, lose that, this stays with the company, and hopefully there's a better resolution than you know pistols at dawn. So you can do your founder agreements on seed legals, and it really is when we get our support team, get web chat messages going, I've had a fallout with my co-founder, the first question is, have you got a founder agreement? If yes, great, let's look what it says. And if no, okay, you're going to have to find out some dispute resolution mechanism or figure out amicably if you can, because you've never specified what happens when things go wrong. Amazing insights. Um, I'm actually going to, one of the biggest mistakes I see founders make, I'm actually going to go back to a, a question that Chloe asked earlier. She said, how worried should someone be about sharing their idea without initial investment startup already in process? Is it simple, sensible or ridiculous to worry about someone would run away with their idea for themselves? This is, for me, one of the biggest mistakes I see founders making at idea stage is sending along an NDA uh, for the investor to sign. Uh, number one, it's just like quite a, a bad way to start off the potential relationship. You're not showing trust. You're also, in my opinion, not betting on yourself. You should be able to say like, this is my idea and I'm going to be the one to execute on it. Um, whenever you send that NDA forward, uh, it can be already put a sour taste in that investor's mouth uh, for those reasons. Anthony, do you want to build on that at all? Absolutely. So investors will almost never sign an NDA other than later in the funding round process as part of due diligence, where you're going to share your business contracts and employment agreement as part of due diligence. And there you can reasonably ask them to sign an NDA. But when you're sending out a pitch deck, if you ask someone to sign an NDA, it just indicates a founder that's really naive. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're an investor and you're getting tons of incomings each day and you just, I mean, literally the stats show investors spend three minutes looking at a slide deck. And now one of them comes along and says you need to sign an NDA. I mean, you're just going to hit delete on the email. It's not going to get any further. But it indicates that I think, you know, what makes you investable is not a new idea, but you as a founder. So learning to project as a founder that right amount of self-confidence before it falls over into, you know, drinking so much of your own Kool-Aid that like you're, you, it's OTT, that you want to be boyish, confident, and as you say, you know, I, well, as I say, ideas are cheap, execution is expensive. So there are any number of ideas floating around, it's how you build it. The other thing to note is the reason the person is an investor and not a founder is because they've got time, but not money. They're not going to, if they were in the business of taking ideas, they would have been a founder. The reason they're writing checks is they don't want to build it themselves. They want to find people who, who, who are going to build it themselves and give them money to do it and make return on investment. So in fact, it's just the opposite. You may have heard the term building in public. So, you know, the, the reality is most things fail because nobody wants them. And it's much better to find that nobody wants it before you've built it than after it. So if you hold everything close to your chest and no, don't share with anyone, you're going to build all the stuff. And then after spending, you know, months, years, hundreds of thousands of pounds, ta-da, open the door. And it turns out nobody was looking for that. So what I like to do is I like to sort of pre-announce something, write the press release, even before you've built it. And then if no one's interested, then don't even bother building it. And if people are interested, then go off and build a prototype and test that. So I think, in fact, it's just the opposite. I mean, you might, for example, if you're building something that for Facebook, you might want to not take it to Facebook right at the initial point, but as a general proposition, spreading the word widely before you do it will get the validation. And it's extremely unlikely that somebody else will read it and go, I should jump out of bed and do this instead of everything else in the same way you've never done that. So yeah, my take is build in public, share widely, socialize the idea widely, uh, because that gives you valuable insight into what people really want before you spend time building it. Yeah, and you'll find most people are looking to help. 
So they'll look at, they'll say find someone there or think about someone in their network and they're ready ready to make introductions. So it's the value, uh, the potential value vastly outweighs uh, the negative consequences in my opinion. Exactly. And you look to yourself, which is, you know, when people have told you what they're doing, you know, in other startups, you don't go, oh, I'm just going to give up what I'm doing and do exactly that. You you, <laughs> you, you think, well, like, should I you? Am I likely to use that or not? And it's going to be the same when you tell people what you're doing. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Um, kind of moving on to another topic, um, we're often, uh, you know, speaking with with founders and uh, about their advisory teams. Um, I know that you have your own thoughts about advisory teams, um, so I'd be curious to get some of your insights, um, you know, about building an advisory team. Uh, also, maybe if you do think it's a perfect fit, uh, you know, is, is it worth giving equity? What are the equity structures like uh, that you see? Okay. I think that my take on advisors is uh, I think early stage founders overvalue advisors. So what's an advisor? An advisor, I mean, they you know have different roles. Some of them will help on business plan and products. Some of them will make partner introductions and so on. But broadly, an advisor is somebody who's doing something else for a living and spending a day a month working with your company. And what happens is you living and breathing the problem space on a 24-7 basis. You've got all these ideas. The team is behind and building it. You, you want to charge on a monthly basis, but your customers want to not pay monthly and want to buy on demand. Whatever it is, you know the problem space and you try to solve it. And the advisor breezes in once a month and goes, oh, yeah, no, I think you should uh, you know do everything on a recurring uh, model and you should pivot this. It's 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 it's. There's no connection with an advisor between the offered wisdom and the ownership of the outcome and success. So I think I'm not a huge fan of advisors. I mean, obviously, go and talk to people and get advice. But I think that founders, when they bring on advisors, may overvalue the perceived you know, advice they're going to get. So uh, the first thing is, uh, and by the way, one reason people want advisors as well is because they think it's going to look good on the pitch deck. I've got Tim Berners-Lee on my advisory board. Okay, great. But I think astute investors know that, uh, you know, people are just there as a figurehead or really bring advice. In some cases, the fact you've managed to get, you know, well-known figures is really important. But mm -hmm. let's say you find an advisor and you're now quite clear in your mind what you want them to do. The first thing is to create an advisor agreement for them, which you can do on seed legals. So that specifies what they're going to do. And that means if it's not working out, you can terminate them because what you don't want is to give people money or equity, and then it's just meh, they're giving you random bits of advice, it's not fair, and you, you can't get rid of them. So a contract in the same way with an employee is with an advisor saying these are the things you're going to do, you're going to spend a day a month or a day a week or whatever it might be, helping on the following things, it's going to be for a period of one year, you know, typically, maybe you make it two years, so it, it comes to a natural end, and then you can renew it if you both want to, rather than being a bit, you know, nasty and terminating. And then, uh, you know, in some cases, advisors might offer their advice freely, but often they're going to want compensation. So you can give them cash, or you can give them equity. Ironically, advisors who want cash I think it's a bad signal because you want people who are successful to be advisors. And if you're successful, you don't need the thousand pounds a month or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you probably want to stake in equity because you didn't need the money today. But if things take off and are great, you know, that's awesome. But uh, so if you're giving equity, then the question is how much equity? So the advisor might go, I'd like 2% equity. And is that a reasonable number or is it an insane number? So here's the way I like to think about it. So if you're giving an advisor cash, let's say the advisor is spending a day a month helping you, what's a reasonable amount of cash? Maybe £10,000 a year, hypothetically. And that, that would probably be my starting point. So uh, now if you're giving equity, let's say your company valuation is £2 million. So 1% of that is £20,000. So half a percent is £10,000. So you would say, I, uh, the advisor, I could give you £10,000 a year, or I can give you 
0.5% equity vesting over one year. So whenever you give equity, always make it vest over a period because in the same way you don't pay the advisor their entire annual salary on January the 1st, you pay them by month. Likewise, you're going to give them some shares or typically share options and they're going to vest over one year uh, so you can decide what to do the next year and you calculate the amount of options based on the value of the company, you know, uh, designate it as a pound uh, amount to, to calculate it. And then, of course, you can also agree with the advisor, you know, for the purpose of the equity calculation, let's do £10,000 and let's base it on a £2 million valuation. And, and then I'll give you uh, share options and we'll create an unapproved option scheme, which is the way you'd give options to advisors. So that would be the formula I would suggest. Amazing. Um, so we're gonna open up to uh, some Q&A. Um, if you have any really burning questions, uh, please send them back in um, or drop some new ones in. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, that's where do you think founders should be prioritizing their time pre-revenue? Ah, good question, of course. Um, well, it said the first salesperson in the company is the founder. And when we started Seed Legals, I was literally on a bean bag uh, in the corridor outside our office to not disturb our team who were developing, talking to customers. So, uh, you know, if you talk to customers directly, then you will see what they really want. The other good advantage of being an initial salesperson is if you go and hire a salesperson too soon and you've got nothing really ready to sell, the salesperson twiddles their thumbs and becomes frustrated and leaves because you keep promising you'll have a saleable product soon. So I think the first thing is the ability to sell. And of course, you're selling not only to customers, but you're selling yourself and your vision and your team to investors and you're selling your business to people you're going to hire so that everyone goes and follows you on your journey and joins this early stage company. So a great attribute is the ability to sell and, and actually doing that. If you're not the type of person who, you know, is going to be the salesperson yourself, then, you know, make sure your co-founder is. So at Seed Legals, I'm the guy who's front of house talking to people. My co-founder is more strategy, back office, you know, planning, revenue, and, and so on. And uh, I guess I'm more the extrovert. He's more the introvert. And that works together. Uh, the, the second thing, apart from selling, is to be talking to customers, which kind of relates to the selling, but making sure everyone is close to your customers so that you're not building in this ivory tower what you think people want, and it turns out they want something very different. Yeah, very valuable insights there. Um, there was a question earlier, and I think it kind of relates to Rachel's. Um, it was around, uh, you know, the fundraising process and how, how can you get going? Um, like, is it, can you send, you know, cold outreach? Uh, I have thoughts that like, you know, it, cold outreach is a very difficult strategy to do. You can't rely solely on that. Uh, you can't really rely solely on any specific, one specific uh, strategy, in my opinion. It's really about, I think, getting out and networking, uh, going to events. Uh, that's why, you know, outside, living outside of London, uh, there is somewhat more of a, of a challenge in doing that, but maybe finding a few events that are, that are kind of near the same time uh, and making it out to those is, is super beneficial. Um, Anthony, do you have any uh, you know thoughts on that? Uh, well, two parts. I think events are not generally useful for finding investors, but what events mm. are really useful for is benchmarking yourself against other founders. So mm. as an investor, you probably see lots of founders and you instantly spot the ones that project uh, passion, vision, and ability to execute. And you instantly spot the ones who are not there yet. They, uh, you know, want you to sign an NDA and they focused on the wrong things. And, you know, they're still working on a side job and they're not quite sure if things work. So by being at events, you see other founders and you quickly learn. And if you at pitch events and you go, boy, that was a mere pitch. I must never do that. Um, so seeing what others do, 
is immensely valuable, but I don't think you're generally going to find investors at events with with rare exception. The, the second one is then how you find investors. So let's talk about the cold outreach and the warm outreach. So you keep reading everywhere, get a warm intro to a fund. It's like, dude, easy for you to say if you're friends with, you know, Robert Scoble or somebody, but, but most of us aren't. So how am I going to get an intro? Well, uh, if you don't know somebody who can do a warm introduction, who knows the investor, there's the trick you can try. Look up the investor on, on LinkedIn. If it's an angel investor, that's their name. If it's a fund, go and find the person at the fund who might be relevant. LinkedIn will show you who've got his common connections. Reach out to your common connections and ask if one of them can do an intro. So periodically people ping me going, hey, Anthony, you're connected to so-and-so at Seed Camp. Can you do an intro? And most people want to be nice. So if somebody asks me, please don't, by the way, but if people ask me, then I will look in Outlook and I'll look at when I connected with the person and if, if like I connected to them in 2013 and we've never spoken since then, it's, you know, I'd write back to the person going, you know, it's great, but it's going to be kind of random. But if I know the person well, the investor, I might say, you know, it's not a fit. Don't bother with talking to index ventures because they're only going to invest when you get to 3 million revenue, you're wasting your time. Or I might say, actually, if you send me a few lines that I can forward, I'd be delighted to do so. So if you don't know an investor directly, use LinkedIn Common Connections to try and find somebody who could do that for you. And then if you don't know that, you're going to have to master the art of the cold outreach. And so the cold outreach is, I mean, I have a lot of people pinging me and uh, and I'm sure you get, you know, everyone gets uh, random generally spam incomings and you can see it at, at, at a glance if somebody says you know i'm uh what's it i hope your day is going well it's like i've really hit delete on that <laughs> i hope life is is finding you well i it's deleted already but if it's hey anthony i saw an article of yours on on something or other or hey i saw you invested in this company or i noted you tweeted uh you know last week about the UK and this and the innovation fund and we're doing something in that space and I'd love to tell you more about it. And mm. then the the recipient, if they can't decide that if they think like you spent hours researching them and written specifically for that, you know, most people, if they've got any bandwidth available, are going to want to say, yeah, sure, tell me more. So your goal is to create something nice and personalized that gets the person to respond. Of course, that means doing a little bit of work. You know, sometimes AI can help, but often if you use AI, it's just like it screams, this is an AI generated one, and it gets like a no. So, uh, but but if you can work some common connection that gets that has the recipient see why you emailed or messaged on LinkedIn mm -hmm. them directly uh, and and with with the, something that responds like the Netflix episode you just want them to go yes tell me more and then there's your foot in the door got you uh we are coming to the end I'm going to briefly touch on o Omar's question Omar I know you personally man you can pitch I don't think that you should be giving out a small percentage away to someone acting as a partner uh in order to sell to investors you're the founder you need to be able to have these conversations and sell it's just a matter of getting comfortable and having them uh you know it's practice makes perfect no one's going to be perfect at it at the beginning uh you're gonna as Anthony said always be selling um would like to thank everyone for coming today especially Anthony I think there were so many valuable insights on there um Please, if you're, you know, you're at an idea stage, get in contact uh, with myself or, or a member of the Hyper team, and we can try and help guide you to uh, guide you to a launch. Um, and then also, if you're, you know, beyond that and you're looking to incorporate and potentially need some guidance on your early corporate legal work and SEIS, also feel free to get in contact with me, and I will put you in touch with a member of the Seed Legal staff, uh, and uh, they can help you out. They're quite responsive in that regard. Um, any last words, Anthony? And by the way, I'm always uh, delighted if you ping me. i um, Anthony Rose on LinkedIn, Anthony at SeedLegals.com, you know, and, and of course, uh, you know, reach out uh, through Hyper or on, on Seed Legals directly. And we're always delighted 
to help. And if you're lastly, if you head over to the Seed Legal's resources section, there are tons of articles, videos on how to find investors, uh, how to pitch. There's a, a pitch deck template and more. So there are a lot of resources, all of them, you know, completely free. And, uh, you know, I think in the early stages, a lot of it is learning the art and craft of looking and feeling like an investable founder. And if you can conquer that, then life is much easier afterwards. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great rest of your day and an even better weekend. Talk to you later. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.